Hey everybody, so today we are joined by Dean Alamang, who, if you don't know, has written a fabulous book on ontologies in practicality, I would say. And this is a book that I always direct people to if they're starting to learn ontologies on the job or just ontologies in general. So a link is down below if you wanna go and check that out. This is not a paid promotional video. We are going to be talking about RDF Star and what it's all about and is it necessary? Is it not? Is it too early to tell? All of those things and more in this video. So if this sounds interesting to you, keep on watching. Hi, I'm Dean Alamang. I'm author of Semantic Web for the Working Ontologist. I'm a semantic web and linked data enthusiast. And I'm so into linked data that I actually have a <laughs> fair data tea mug. So um, yeah, I guess I'm a, a little bit of a of a linked data data sharing geek. Um, okay, you you're in good company. <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of thought that I might find some more folks like that uh, amongst your, your listenership. Probably. There's there's quite a few out there. And so today I'm very excited because we are going to be talking about something that a lot of folks on the channel have been asking about. So we have some videos and I'll link them down below and above on just traditional RDF and just like how triple stores work and some of those things and standards and all that, right? But then there's this thing called RDF Star and even Sparkle Star, but we're not really going to talk about that a whole lot, I think, here. But what does that actually mean? So for those that aren't in the know, Dean, how would you define what is RDF Star and yeah. how is it different than traditional RDF? Yeah. So actually, you know, in prep for a blog entry that I'm posting this same week, I looked up the RDF Star Charter and I was quite happy to find because this is not always the case, that the charter had a nice, short, succinct description of what they were doing. Oh, fine. And, Good. And so what is RDF Star? It's an extension of RDF and Sparkle related recommendations with the ability to concisely represent and query statements about statements. So that's 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 like one line of printed stuff, but that's actually a lot packed into There's that. Yeah, when you talk about a statement about a statement, if you think about normal ways that you might get data, so if I download a spreadsheet from my bank, that's data. There's a line there that says this credit card had a purchase at this merchant on this date for this amount. All those statements, what is the bank saying? Is it asserting that they are true? <laughs> is it saying that this showed up in some system? And as we all know, we can challenge these things you know, because sometimes they're not true. Mm -hmm. What are we saying when we present you with a table? Yeah. And most data systems, RDF included, don't have any way of talking about that. There's the data. There it is. You process it. It's up to you to decide, do I believe it? Do I kind of believe it? Yeah. Am I simply asserting it as a devil's advocate argument? What, what am I saying about yeah. this data? RDF Star is saying, sometimes we want to make statements about statements. Yeah. Let's see what we can do with that. So it's actually quite groundbreaking in comparison to RDF. You asked, how does it differ from RDF? RDF doesn't do this. In the same way, how does it differ from an Excel spreadsheet? That doesn't do that. A relational database doesn't do that. Yeah. Pretty, even XML documents, which are you know, pretty darn rich with what they do, yeah. don't do that. And certainly not, I mean, you can do that with any of these things, but not out of the box. And RDF yeah. stars says, hey, let's standardize a way to do this mm -hmm. so we can all do it the same way. I've seen yeah. any number of bespoke ways to do this. I'm sure you have as well. But can yeah. we do it right so we can do it together? And that's yeah. the real innovation there. Well, and and the way that I would kind of describe that, I always use the, the five-year-old to grandma, mm. <laughs> right, argument is like, how do I describe this to someone? It's kind of a qualifier, right? Like mm. on that data, when did it happen compared to that data on a different date, right? Like that mm -hmm. whole reification thing that kind of mm -hmm. had to happen in RDF doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily have to happen now because you have RDF star where you can then declare more on, on that property, right? And that's what, what we're talking about here is adding even more specificity, whether something mm -hmm. is true and when was it true? You can even put some provenance on some this. A lot of my clients are interested in what they call bi-temporal data. Mm -hmm. So not only when was it true, but when did you know uh -huh. it was true? And you have two dimensions of that. And for a lot of regulatory things, that's actually really important yeah, in terms of treating a patient who at some time had a condition, which you didn't know about until later, mm -hmm. and you treated them in between 
and the treatment that you gave them was counterindicated by the condition and they died. Bitemporal data is really important in, in a lot of these places. It is. The and and thing. I love that example because, I mean, you just made it so real, right? I mean, yeah. first, anytime someone says, oh, it's just data, you know, well, it's fine. I'm like, no, 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 no. Data can hurt people. Data oh, thank can you, Ashley. change when, when, a lot of things. You know, when my normal friends, you know, say, oh, you're into data. Oh, it's just data. And it's like people, people live and die. You know, we, we, yeah. we fight pandemics or fail to fight pandemics based on data. We yeah. <laughs> manage public policy or fail. You know, all these things, it's just data, just data. Yeah, no, just, like and, and then it's not even talking about the people, right? Like there's so many things on my channel. I won't go into it uh, too much here, but there's people behind that data that that data represents, right? Like the person yeah. you're talking about, because there was this missing element, right? Mm -hmm. Between the data points, mm -hmm. something wasn't caught or something wasn't addressed correctly. And that is so important in so many different aspects. And that's where, that's why I do truly believe graph is, is a great solution. Again, when appropriate, not everything's a graph solution, but that's where the specialness comes in. Like why graph? Well, you can express so much more in a graph and find yeah. more uh, data that is more rich even in graph. Than um, we're talking about data sharing. Graphs are so much better at data sharing. So not only are they more expressive than the way you just said for all those reasons, it's mm -hmm. also if you want to be sharing data. And if you've been looking at the blog that I started with my New Year's resolution, you know, the key guiding light through that is data sharing. And that's why I have a fair data mug um, because <laughs> data sharing is what it all it's all about. Yeah. Which is actually back to exactly what we're talking about. Yes. You've got these statements, but who said that this particular image is licensed with CC0? Yep. Um, if somebody said this, but or maybe I inferred it from what they said. What kind of confidence can I have in my data? So I bought yeah. a little side, side back. <laughs> so, the, so, so the side conversation actually proved a point. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of the provenance, right? Like if you're trying yes. to, I, I have another video coming out later this year on, you know, there's a lot of generative AI right now. Where did it come from? Are you actually allowed to use that? Yeah. So, so because you are such, you know, an authority. So describe to us a little bit, if you don't mind, like, what is changing? Why is RDF not able to do what RDF star does? Like how, how does that work? Like, why do we need a whole new thing? Yeah. So actually that's a good question because to some extent we don't. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about if you, if you don't mind when, what sort of new things don't we need a new thing for and which ones do we need to get? And that's actually the, the title of my blog is why I'm not excited about RDF star, which the people watching so far are going to say, huh, you seem pretty excited about this thing. So, <laughs> and, and the fact is, you know, the title is, is really just the lead, right? You know, actually, I You're excited, excited about the capability, maybe not the thing that we're talking about with RDF. Well, star. actually, no, I'm, 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 I'm um, not excited about it try, being able to solve problems that many people think it will mm. and it actually don't need to be solved. And that's what I'll talk about right now. Mm -hmm. So, in all the examples that you've done of RDF star in this call, um, you've actually used RDF star very correctly. I'm not too surprised you're a PhD in computational linguistics. You're going to make the right distinctions about it most <laughs> of the time. So this is hardly a surprise. But what you've done, you've talked about provenance. You've talked about time. Um, I talked about certainty. These are all statements about statements. But what you often see um, in the literature, and I've been in the blog that I'm posting, I have a couple of examples. You'll see someone, and here's an example from there. I'm flying from New York to San Francisco. So New York connects to San Francisco is a statement. First of all, that's kind of a weird statement, but let's leave that aside. And you say, but wait a minute, that trip has a price. And so I'm gonna hang the price on that. We use RDF star to hang that price on there. And yeah, that's the right look to make. Um, <laughs> that's an even better look to make. So wait a minute, um, you know, what, what's going on here? Well, a couple of things are going on. First of all, that connection was a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. We don't usually talk about San Francisco connects to New York when we're talking about a flight. Mm -hmm. um, normally, we go to a travel agent. We say, I would like to purchase. And we actually have a word for this in English, a flight from. And we have words for that, too. San mm -hmm. Francisco. Well, which way did I say San Francisco to New York or New York, whichever way it was from New yeah. York to San Francisco. And Priceline actually made a whole business of allowing you to make offers 
on that thing. That's what we, and when you find out when you take this stuff seriously, you don't say New York connects to San Francisco. That was bad modeling. Mm -hmm. And the good modeling can actually come from the way experts talk. And so that's the problem that RDF doesn't solve. I get it. Yeah. It's almost because... like people are going to use it as a shortcut. So they exactly. use models. I yeah, you're, gotcha. so, you're so good at taking my you know, two and a half paragraphs and summing them up into five words. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I do video because it, I don't have to write the two, two and a half paragraphs. <laughs> but for those that do want, the, the link will be down below for, for Dean's uh, blog that he's talking about because you definitely should read it. There's going to be a lot more detail in it. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I, I see that. Yeah. And I also do want to caution. Like there's no... It all depends on your use case, right? Like when you're doing a model, it really does depend on your use case. You should use precise words, like to Dean's point, but you don't necessarily have to listen to certain people that say, no, your modeling is wrong. Yeah. You have to be able to support why you are modeling something and you need to make sure that it's going to meet the needs for your use case, right? So and I just want to put that wrong, out. You know, what does wrong mean? You know, and, and that gets why where you know, things like property graphs are so successful because if you're just writing a one-off application, you've got one stakeholder, one use case, one task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, model it that way. And you know, that you, you could actually go ahead and model New York to San Francisco price, <clears throat> whatever it is. And if you're not going on the price line, or if you're not going to talk to the person sitting next to you who's on the same flight, but paid a different price or any of these things, <laughs> it could work out just fine. But if we, again, this goes back to this notion of sharing. If what we're doing is trying to get an industry in alignment. And you and Ellie talked about this an awful lot. That, that, that was a really wonderful video where you're talking about what well, we have these things come together. I like the video cool. above that Dean's mentioning. Yeah, you just throw this data together and it all works. It's like, well, actually it's an awful lot of work to sort out the, the mismatches. And that's what we're talking about here. And if you're using words that are well known in the industry, and if you actually talk about how they link together, at least you have a fighting chance of understanding what the data was so yeah. that when you're doing this, you're not just you're know, wandering around in the dark. Yeah. Well, and that's one question I do have is, you know, is this going to make, you know, because there's Sparkle Star, um, mm -hmm. is it going to make Sparkle queries even more complex? And here's why I say this, because a lot of folks do go into the property graph side. Be sometimes they just, you know, don't know any better and they just pick it because it's the the biggest and loudest one out there. Sometimes it's, it, there's a lot of different reasons. And, and by the way, I'm not against property graphs. No, the there's, there's very good reasons for them. Yeah, but absolutely. A lot I actually make folks, the same point in another blog. I started saying, look, yeah. you're not going to see me fighting against graph representations. Good God, how long did it take us to even get the world to think of talking about data in graphs at all? We're yeah. not going to sit here and infight amongst ourselves. No, 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 please don't. Well, and there's a time and a place and you can use them both together. I have done yeah. that in many jobs, right? Well, that's interesting. I've not done that. I mean, in principle, you could, but I've never actually no. done that. That's the funny thing. I keep hearing people say that, but I mean, it's, it's, it, it was no different than breathing air. Honestly, it was like, yeah, these two things can live together. It's fine. They, well, you know, my, my colleague Juan Cicada is working on this committee for the, um, the, the property graph query language. And he likes to talk about, I, I bet Juan actually has used these things together. Oh, I know he has. Okay. Yeah. I've talked to him about it. Yeah. He's, he certainly has, but yeah. to, to, to the point here is, um, do you think having RDF star and Sparkle star is going to make it even more difficult for folks to learn Sparkle and RDF? Because a lot of people see there is a big learning curve. Is this making it yeah. even harder or do you think it's actually going to make it easier? Actually, I don't think it'll make any difference at all. And the reason okay. why is that if you're using this right, if you use it as a crutch, like you were talking about before, then yeah, you're, you're basically inviting in all this extra complexity. Remember what we said at the beginning here, this is something that no data system is doing. You know, if we did a SQL star that lets you talk about temporality in your, I don't know what it would look like. Um, yeah, suddenly SQL gets harder. But guess what? Most people who start off with SQL or with Excel or anything else aren't doing by temporal reasoning when they start off. Yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, it took me a while to get my head around by temporal reasoning. Once you do, it's sort of, oh my God, shouldn't all reasoning be te by temporal? Actually, no, it shouldn't, uh, because you can do an awful lot of perfectly good applications that aren't temporal at all. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and in fact, most of them have. Most applications, anyone you and I know, mm -hmm. almost certainly have been non-temporal ones, you yeah. know, unless we hang around those particular banks and those particular. Yeah. Uh, Although I will places. say, like, even I mean, as you're saying that, you know, immediately one of my older. I don't want to say older. It's not that old, 
uh, one of the older graphs that I worked on um, before was all topical and it was for research, right? So can you find how these two research topics connect to each other? But because we as humans put a label on what that topic is, mm-hmm. that changes over time, right? And so those historical notes and all those. So I can see how even there, yeah, temporal but, is imp- impacting. Yeah, But when you're learning, it's easy enough to get started <clears throat> with SQL not star or Sparkle not star and RDF not star and build your whole application. And then if at some point you say, gee, <clears throat> you know, like you just did, actually, I'm having trouble with the conclusions I'm drawing. And actually graphs, I think, have this weird um you know, sort of tyranny of competence you can now do what in a sequel world would be 10 joins and you just do them as a big long chain and suddenly you start thinking wait a minute how do i think about the interaction of the provenance or the temporal parts of all the pieces of the chain why didn't i have to think about this in sequel because you never got around to writing 10 joins that's why uh, but now <laughs> you're doing it, you're i love this. that that's so and true. this is rdf or property graphs either one is it at this point i mean graphs. or you did or you did get around to writing all those joints and it's such a giant piece of code that runs for 12 days. You're like, yeah, I don't know what's in there. I'm not. And, and, and it never, it never even got to the point where you would have the luxury <laughs> of worrying about how provenance combines. Yeah. And so suddenly you're coming and saying, gee, I now have the luxury of worrying about this because again, back to the, what the, the interview you had with Ellie, we're now actually getting our data sharing. So a lot of the plumbing is out of the way. We have the luxury to worry about things like, competing provenance competing licensing as we were talking about earlier on you're, you're going to, have to keep that part in here ashley because i know i know <laughs> that's okay that's all right <laughs> and uh and, and competing temporal scales or bi temporal scales depending on, on how uh tricky you need to get and then you're gonna say gee i need to do this is there a way to do that and here in sql or rdf what do you do in sql you put in a special sort of many many join table and you put some annotations track Tech at the end of it. Yeah. So how many people are actually using RDF star at this point? Or do you see maybe using within a year? Or is this more like a longer term kind of thing? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because personally, I've I've not used RDF reification at all in, in the 20 years I've been doing RDF. I've almost I actually got two different names for this kinds of reification. There's this, the RDF reification that's built into the system. Mm-hmm. And every time I've seen somebody use it, I've always found they used it wrong. Um, and by wrong, they've actually made their, their lives much worse. And I show them how they can model it in a more natural way. I go, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Would you just please read chapter three? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did another quick story at one of the banks I was at, we had some question about how to implement something and the chief engineer it actually escalated all the way up to the managing director and the managing director who's a brilliant man they come in they and it's hard to get his time and they start to outline the problem and he just shuts down the chief engineer and says is this the problem you're talking about and he finishes it for him he goes yeah and he goes i gave every one of you a copy of dean's book read chap go home read chapter three again you'll know the answer to this we do it this way mm-hmm. um Anything else we need to discuss? Get out of my office. As a <laughs> as an author, this has got to be the crowning moment of my life, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty cool. I I mean, I can see it though. I mean, again, not not to like make your head big or anything, but like everybody <laughs> I ever talked to, they're like, yeah, that like you know, that's one of the first books they read when they get into yeah. this. And um, mm-hmm. so, I mean, that's that's big. <laughs> But let me get back to your question here. So, you know, every time I've had the temptation to use the RDF reification, which is quite reviled by pretty much everybody, I've found that I really want to do domain, what I call domain reification, which is where you actually get a word from the domain, like flight in the example we had earlier. Um, Wedding is another one example I use a lot. Um, Bid, offer, um, ask is Mm -hmm. is an example of these things these words from the domain that actually reify the stuff in a much more natural way and then your applications work a lot better and i have not used rdf star myself because all the temporal stuff i've done um has i've gone that way for things that are domain reification you shouldn't be using it in the first place so i'm not you know and and uh and that's my fear that you summed up in five words where that that people are going to use as a shortcut um, to where they should be doing some actual yeah. modeling. And so, <clears throat> you know, for my own practice, it's not, I don't see it making a big difference. Um, not just yet. Yeah. Well, and I think there's also, and again, I don't, I 
don't know anybody that's using RDSR either. Um, yeah. So if anyone in the audience knows, or you mm -hmm. are, like, leave a comment because I, I think that's well, going to be fun to listen. Is actually, the people working on that, so Adrian and Aura, are the two your main editors, that these are people I have huge amounts of respect for. I mean, the, these guys really know their stuff. Yeah. And, and, and what I always find, especially with Adrian, I love following his Twitter. He's always coming up with cool new stuff. It's like, you know, if Adrian's into this, there's got to be something to it, right? There's got to be something to it. I'm glad that you're you're tackling this topic because I myself have been struggling a little bit, even thinking like RDF star is meeting a certain pain point that a lot of folks have or think they have at least. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's going to be a thing. But you know, I, I do wish that we had more emphasis on um, not just this this aspect of, of modeling, but how do we get folks that don't want or don't need to learn RDF to, to mm -hmm. be able to start modeling? And, mm -hmm. you know, part of that is going to be that translation, right, of a normal person modeling something. And how do you get that into RDF? I, I kind of feel like that's going back to the adoption play, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, that's, that's the big struggle that I see a lot of is, um, folks that are coming in from the relational databases mm -hmm. or they just, you know, they, they, they don't know how RDF is what it is. And, um, it's, it's just, it, it just seems like such a learning curve for folks. Right. And, and yeah. I think if we want to try to get more adoption, it's got to be around that. Oh, so now, there is, of course, the standard, you know, read my blog, but really the, the sort of takeaway I'm going to say from the blog is that if you want to figure out whether you're using RDF star or not, it's actually right there in the charter. Are you really making a statement about a statement? Mm -hmm. You made a bunch of wonderful examples to the, of this yourself at the very beginning of this, or are you making a statement about something in your domain? The cost is in your domain. The time that you came to know the validity of a statement is about the statement. Mm -hmm. It's actually not that hard to figure out when to use it correctly and when you're doing the shortcut.